Hello and welcome. I'm Fred Lublin. On behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity titled Right Patient, Right Treatment, Right Time, Utilizing Early High Efficacy Therapies to Improve Outcomes in Relapsing Remitting MS. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. Today's CME CE activity is also eligible for ABIM MOC points. Actively participate in today's program, and once you complete today's program, be sure to provide your ABIM ID and birth date in the evaluation, and CME Alphas will submit your MOC points. As I mentioned, I'm Dr. Fred Lublin. I'm the Saunders Family Professor of Neurology and Director of the Corinne Goldsmith Dickinson Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. I'm looking forward to our discussion today, which will focus on strategies for the diagnosis and treatment of patients with relapsing remitting MS. Let me in introduce our faculty who are joining me. First, let me welcome Dr. Joseph Berger. Dr. Berger is Professor of Neurology and the Associate Chief of the Multiple Sclerosis Division at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Fred. Also, let me introduce Dr. Ann Cross. Dr. Cross is Professor of Neurology and also holds the Manny and Rosalind Rosenthal and the John L. Trotter Multiple Sclerosis Center Chair in Neuroimmunology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. Welcome, Ann. Thanks, Fred. Now, let me start with our first learning objective, which is select patients with RRMS who are likely to benefit from early treatment with high efficacy disease modifying treatments. Our second learning objective is to develop tailored treatment approaches based on individual patient characteristics. And our third objective is to apply the latest clinical data on approved and emerging disease modifying therapies in monitoring and treatment response, safety, and tolerability. So let's start with our first patient case. Here's Julie, a 22-year-old white female with no significant prior medical history. She has a sudden onset of blurred vision in the right eye and pain in that eye on movement. She also complains of fatigue and innervation in warm weather, which has been present for over a year. She denies Laramide symptom, vertigo, diplopia, sphincter dysfunction, paresthesia or numbness, weakness or imbalance. So let me get our audience involved. The question is on your screen and you can choose your response to our first question. We're not gonna show you the results just yet, but please put your answers in and I'll share the results with you a little later on. Okay, so Joe, let's start. Would you uh, discuss with us the different phenotypes of MS? Sure, uh, currently we divide MS into several phenotypes. Uh, one is the clinically isolated syndrome, which is when the first when the patient first presents uh, with their initial symptom, as would be the case uh, with our patient presenting here. Uh, she presents with optic neuritis. She doesn't tell you that she has any other definable uh, lesion somewhere in the central nervous system, although your antenna are raised because she comments on fatigue that's been present for a year, a very common manifestation with her OEMS. And she also comments on a lack of energy when she's exposed to heat, although many people complain of that. There's radiologically isolated syndrome, which is that patient who comes in having had migraine headaches or some other reason for having had an MRI performed and has a disease in their brain that was not clinically apparent otherwise. Uh, and there are criteria for establishing the diagnosis of radiologically isolated syndrome. Remitting and relapsing multiple sclerosis is the form that we see most commonly. Uh, those individuals uh, diagnosed with MS, uh, it's about 85%, whereas 15%, 10 to 15% present initially with what's called primary progressive disease. Now, relapsing remitting disease is one in which the individual should have a second event. Uh, and that event may be manifest clinically or in some other way which we'll talk about in a little while. With primary progressive disease, a, a form of the illness that we see generally in an older population, uh, the illness slowly progresses over a period of time and can be quite difficult to diagnose if you don't consider it. And then secondarily progressive uh, MS is that form of the illness that many people advance to 
after a decade or more of the disease, when the disease takes on a life of its own and, and moves from a relapsing remitting phase to one in which there's progression. Now that progression can sometimes have superimposed on it relapses. Um, so it is a, a form of the illness in which one can still see relapses superimposed on the progression. So we're focusing on relapsing remitting MS uh, today. Why don't you take us through the diagnostic criteria? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, you should have two, if you're going to diagnose the disease clinically, uh, as you see on the slide, you should have two or more clinical attacks with clinical evidence of two or more lesions. That is, uh, on your physical examination, and recall the neurologists are still the discipline that walks around with the black bag and lays hands on patients, uh, making telemedicine very difficult. Uh, so uh, you, you should have some objective evidence on your physical examination or alternatively evidence of uh, one lesion uh, with a prior attack involving a lesion in a distinct anatomic location. If you have that, you have no further evidence that's needed. You don't have to do an MRI. You don't have to do a lumbar puncture, though you, you would do the MRI because it informs you about uh, other, other things such as prognosis, which we will talk about later uh, during the course. Um, or you have a patient with a history of two or more attacks with clinical evidence of only one lesion. In that instance, you want evidence on MRI uh, of hyperintense signal abnormalities uh, or wait and see if the patient develops another clinical attack. Uh, you know, the Dutch have a proverb which says, uh, and, uh, an ounce of patience is worth a pound of brains. Sometimes it takes a while to feel comfortable with the diagnosis. So there are patients that come to you who you suspect multiple sclerosis, but you have a very difficult time uh, fully feeling comfortable with the diagnosis because there's insufficient evidence either radiographically or in spinal fluid examination and one has to simply follow them clinically. Uh, on this slide, you'll see there's been a change in the recent past with the update of the um, McDonald criteria to include oligoclonal bands. So as indicated on this slide, um, if you have evidence of dissemination in space and dissemination in time, based on your clinical findings in MRI, you can establish the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. If you have evidence of uh, isolation in space um, and an MRI, either clinically or by MRI, but you don't have it in time, you'd need a second event, uh, either clinically or by MRI, or you'd need the spinal fluid findings of oligoclonal bands, which will now substitute for, um, for your dissemination in time. If you have a clinically isolated syndrome in an MRI without dissemination in space, you need to have a second event or a new MRI finding to give you that dissemination in both space and time in order to call it multiple sclerosis. Thanks, Joe. So Anne, why don't you take us through the, the MRI criteria? So uh, Fred, uh, as you know, the MRI has become increasingly important in making the diagnosis of MS. And I would start out by saying that uh, if you have a patient that you think might have MS and you do good quality MRIs of the brain and the spinal cord uh, with um, at least a 1.5 Tesla scanner and uh, axial scans of three millimeters with no gaps and you see no lesions, then, then I would highly question the diagnosis. Uh, but that said, um, the uh, newest McDonald criteria allow dissemination in space with only two lesions, uh, one at least in each of at least uh, two of four locations, periventricular, uh, cortical or juxtacortical, infratentorial, and spinal cord, which are all illustrated here. And um, I did want to point out that uh, people sometimes get confused about periventricular and particularly juxtacortical lesions. Uh, periventricular means a lesion that is next to the ventricle with no intervening white matter. And the same goes for juxtacortical. This is, a, this is not a subcortical lesion. This is a juxtacortical lesion with no intervening white matter. And, um, and that sometimes is helpful in separating out vascular lesions or lesions of other etiologies from 
MS. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out about these criteria is that at least this latest rendition of the McDonald criteria was very um, explicit about the fact that these criteria are to be applied uh, or should be applied in people who have a clinically isolated typical of demyelination syndrome. So something like optic neuritis or uh, a brainstem syndrome with uh, intranuclear ophthalmoplegia or a partial transverse myelitis, those types of things, not just um, some kind of neurological um, manifestation that might not be typical of demyelination. So, um, because we don't want to have too many misdiagnoses either. And misdiagnosis has been an issue. So here are the MRI findings for Julie. Her exam shows uh, a visual acuity is 2020 on the left and 2030 on the right with color desaturation in the right eye. Spinal fluid had a normal cell count, normal protein, but eight unique oligoclonal bands. Uh, alternate diagnoses for optic neuritis were ruled out. And here we see her MRI. She has several hyperintense lesions, T2 lesions. None of these are contrast enhancing and none are in the infratentorial compartment. While not seen on this slide, there was enhancement of the right optic nerve uh, and there were no uh, spinal cord lesions. So let me go back to our audience now. And you see the question here. Okay, so we have before and after results, before in blue, after in green. And so we've got the majority of people now have gone for uh, multiple sclerosis first episode, whereas the majority were in the insufficient data, I don't know, before this. So, so Joe and Ann, what do you think about this? So uh, this is a patient that comes from my clinic, and I, I felt quite comfortable seeing the MRI and the spinal fluid results and labeling her with uh, the optic neuritis being the first episode of multiple sclerosis that she had. She fulfills criteria for dissemination in time with the oligoclonal bands. She's had one clinical event, but she certainly has uh, multiple lesions, several of which are quite typical for multiple sclerosis, particularly those exhibit with Dawson's finger appearance to them on the MRI. So uh, I would have labeled her and had multiple sclerosis first episode. Ann? So, so technically, she's still clinically isolated syndrome because she hasn't met all the dissemination in space criteria, but um, because she has periventricular lesions but doesn't have infratentorial or spinal cord or juxtacortical, correct? So but my argument would be, you're correct about that, but my argument would be that that's the problem with the criteria that we have, not with the disease that she has. And so I was going to say, Joe, that I think she has MS too. I mean, her, her lesions look like MS, she smells like MS, and in fact, there was a lot of argument in those criteria about whether to put in lesions in the, in the optic nerve or not. And um, it was ultimately decided by the group who came up with those criteria not to include optic nerve. And, and so you're both right, because we didn't give the, uh, the localization of the super, uh, super tentorial lesions. Uh, and given that there were seven, I will make it easy and say, well, one of them was periventricular and at least one of them was juxtacortical. All right, Fred, let me just argue this. She has contrast enhancement in the optic nerve and seven, uh, we know from uh, the, that she had multiple other lesions in her brain of different age. So she's got dissemination in time on an MRI, but they didn't include optic nerve. Yeah, there, we don't have time to go into that tonight, but uh, there were some very good reasons why optic nerve was not uh, included, although there are arguments on both sides. So let's, let's go on to the next question we have. Okay, so majority said good, and then the rest variable, I don't know, I don't know. So, okay, these are good. So, so Anne, give us an idea of the predictors of poor prognosis in MS? Well, Fred, thanks for asking. Um, this is, um, even here in 2020, I would say that we do not have a crystal ball to say what's gonna happen to somebody, but we have a lot of statistical prognostic factors um, that have to be sort of integrated into the equation. It's, 
but it's not a simple matter of like counting up all the factors and the good prognostic factors. So that said, poor prognostic factors include being male, she's not male, being not of European descent, she is of European descent, uh, and then a number of other modifiable um, environmental factors like vitamin D status. Um, clinical factors include uh, being relapsing, remitting, and having a good recovery, and her visual acuity was pretty good uh, the last time uh, you mentioned it, and so that would be a good recovery, and she hasn't had a lot of relapses, another good um, clinical prognosticator, and she didn't have uh, polysymptomatic onset, which means like in, in addition to her optic neuritis, she also had an INO or something like that. So she didn't have more than one thing going on and she doesn't apparently have any cognitive deficits. All of those are good things for her. Um, she doesn't have what most of us would consider a high number of T2 weighted lesions and um, she doesn't appear to have a lot of brain atrophy, though we haven't really commented on that. Then there are a lot of biomarkers that are out there in the literature, um, most of which are not validated. Um, Roberta Magliozzi and I did a review of these, just the um, non-MRI biomarkers about a year ago in MS Journal. And um, really the only ones that are, have held up are the numbers and presence of both IgG and IgM oligoclonal bands. The higher numbers of IgG oligoclonal bands, the worse the patient is. And I can't really tell you what eight would mean. Um, in terms of other things that have been proposed, like neurofilament light chain in the spinal fluid, that does have some prognostic um, significance, but it's not clinically available to most people. And, and the same would go for a uh, chitinase-like uh, one uh, in the spinal fluid, also known as YKL40. Um, so there are a number of things. Um, she tends to have a lot of good prognostic factors, or at least she lacks the poor prognostic factors. So I'm hopeful she'll do well. Okay, good. So before we go on to the next question, I want to take up a, a question that came up. And uh, so someone in the audience asked an interesting question, and that is, would a lesion in the cortical area and a second lesion in a juxtacortical region, region count for DIS? I want to confirm cortical and juxtacortical review independently or not. Uh, according to the criteria, they are not viewed independently. They are one thing. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that was a, a matter, a point of discussion during their meeting, but um, but they are listed together, just like infratentorial is listed as one place and spinal cord is listed as one place. So at least my read of the criteria is that you have to have at least two lesions and they have to be in, those two lesions have to be in two of those categories of space, like um, periventricular versus spinal cord. Yeah, that was, that's the intention of the criteria. I agree. Okay, so let's go back to Julie. The yeses have it, which is good because now let's go on to the follow-up question. Okay, Joe, would you go through the different categories of DMTs that we use for management of MS, the pros and cons of each? Sure, I'd be happy to. So the three broad categories are defined as immunomodulators, cell trafficking inhibition agents, and cell depleting therapies. And that might have been a confusing question to some people because they might not have known what drug that they would have preferred, what category it fit in. So the immunomodulators are interferon beta, of which there are several, glutiramiracetate, dimethylfumarate, and teriflunamide. These are regarded, for the most part, as quite safe. We have a long-term experience, certainly with the interferons and with copaxone, uh, and they are regarded as having modest efficacy. Now, when I say that, I say it hesitatingly because there's some people that respond beautifully to these drugs, and, and do exceptionally well. Of course, you have to bear in mind that there are people that have been pathologically demonstrated to take MS to the grave with them and not even known they've had it. So there, there's uh, a bell-shaped curve in terms of how people respond to their illness and how they respond to these drugs. The cell trafficking agents, uh, cell trafficking inhibition agents are natalizumab, Fingolimod, saponimod, and ozinimod, which are the S1P receptor modulators. 
and post aponismod, which should be coming out. The pros are it has greater efficacy. Uh, the onset of action is quick, certainly very quick with natalizumab, and for the most part, they appear to be well tolerated. They do carry a risk of opportunistic infection. Uh, the uh, natalizumab and fingolimod have both been associated with PML, though natalizumab orders of magnitude higher than fingolimod. Uh, and there are other opportunistic infections like cryptococcal meningitis that has been seen. Um, the cells are still in the body. Rebound disease is seen when you stop these drugs. Uh, probably has to do with the onset of action, the quick onset of action. Well, you take them off and the action returns. And the long-term safety with these drugs remains unclear, though my sense is that it's go they're going to be relatively well tolerated over long periods of time. And then lastly, you have the cell depleting agents, which include alemtizumab, cladribine, uh, and the anti-CD20s like ocrelizumab uh, and rituximab, which are used in some countries uh, in place of ocrelizumab. Ofatumumab, a drug that uh, should come out in the not too distant future, and of course, a bone marrow transplantation. And these are uh, depleting, um, they deplete the disease-causing cells. Uh, there's um, no rebound disease observed with these uh, these particular therapies, but they too have a risk of opportunistic infections, uh, particularly uh, with alemtizumab uh, and one sees secondary autoimmune disease, again, particularly with alemtizumab. And they're in some instances a bit more cumbersome to use, but that's not entirely true. Uh, as you know, uh, drugs like ocrelizumab uh, are ones that are, can be administered at six month intervals, though the patient has to go to an infusion suite in order to have it uh, infused. So those are the three broad classes of drugs uh, and a way to think about them. So let's take a closer look, Joe, at the, at the current high efficacy agents. Yeah, so um, in looking at these high efficacy agents, uh, and here we have cladribine, fingolimod, elotizumab, and natalizumab. The anti-CD20 should be up there as well, but we'll talk about them in a second. You see that they have a pretty significant um, ability to reduce relapse rates. So the, the, they will lower relapse rates by more than 50%, each and every one of them, uh, at least when compared to placebo and alentizumab when compared to an active comparator uh, in interferon beta. They all have a modest effect on disability progression. Uh, so about a third to 40% in terms of uh, reducing dis future disability. Uh, and they have, in some instances, a pretty profound effect on reducing T2 lesions. Um, and of course, there are safety uh, concerns with them. You certainly wouldn't start a cladribine patient uh, if they had HIV or active chronic infections. Uh, those have to be treated. Uh, before you would initiate it. You never start uh, a HIV patient on cladribine because of the associated lymphopenia. Uh, with fingolimod, we have concerns about uh, cardiac effects, uh, in particular, the slowing of heart rate. That's why they have that uh, first dose observation uh, built into the drug initiation. There's macular edema, bronchial asthma, uh, and a variety of other concerns that one sees, though, by and large, a very well-tolerated drug. Alemtizumab, the biggest concern we have with it, because we see it with free, a fairly high frequency, are autoimmune disorders, uh, in particular, autoimmune thyroid disease, which can occur in up to a third of the patients that you treat with alemtizumab. And with natalizumab, the biggest concern we have, of course, is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, although other uh, problems have been reported with it. They're fortunately fairly uncommon, but PML is a, a huge concern. Uh, there's a risk mitigation strategy for PML that must be followed in which uh, those individuals who are JC virus antibody positive, who've been on the drug for more than two years, uh, uh, should be taken off the drug because the risk of developing PML in that population is just too high at least in my opinion. Uh, I know that there are uh, individuals that remain on it because they like the drug, and there are people that believe that uh, giving it an extended 
uh, dosing intervals will reduce the risk of PML, but it's not zero. So uh, there, I would consider looking at alternatives in that particular population. So now, Anne, let's uh, look at some more recently approved therapies, and we'll start with the oldest of the recently approved, which would be ocrelizumab. Uh, thanks, Fred. Um, so uh, ocrelizumab, I think, was approved in March of 2017 and was studied in two phase three trials, OPERA-1 and OPERA-2, which had similar numbers of patients in them and assured us all uh, they had very similar results. Uh, these drug, the drug was given, it's given as 600 milligrams as an infusion every six months, although the first dose is cut in half and given um, two weeks apart. Um, but in this study, they, the drug was compared not to placebo, but to interferon beta 1A, 44 micrograms, three times a week. And um, in both these trials, a close to 50% reduction in annualized relapse rate versus the active comparator was seen in those people who were on ocrelizumab. And um, there also was about a 40% reduction in disability progression seen in those studies. And um, there was um, a statistically significant um, uh, increase in disability improvement uh, in the patients on ocrelizumab in those studies. Um, in addition, there were like uh, really striking effects on MRI activity to the, to the note of in the 90% reduction of gadolinium enhanced lesions in the ocrelizumab group compared to beta interferon. Uh, but these drugs, this drug is not without its potential risk and side effects. Infusion reactions are common, uh, but in addition, um, there's risk of upper respiratory infections, and there is a uh, seeming risk of increased cancer, particularly uh, invasive ductal breast cancer and other types of cancers compared to uh, the interferon beta group and also in another study in primary progressive MS. So um, a very effective drug for relapsing MS, even compared to an active comparator, but not without some risks. Okay, now let's move on to the newest approved agent uh, for relapsing forms of MS, ozanamod. So yeah, so ozanamod was just approved not too long ago, and this is an oral agent, somewhat similar to fingolimod, uh, but, uh, but also different. It's in that category of sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor modulators, uh, like fingolimod and like siponimod. It's more selective than fingolimod, uh, affecting just uh, mainly the receptors 1 and 5. And um, it's, it was studied in two studies uh, that uh, found a reduction in relapse rate compared to beta interferon um, of not quite 50 or not quite 50% in, in uh, annualized relapse rate and a uh, greater than 50% reduction in gadolinium enhancing lesions uh, compared to beta interferon 1A. Two doses were studied in that in the um, radiant study, but uh, we use um, mostly the, the higher dose, which is 0.92 milligrams or one milligram uh, per day orally. And um, ozanamod has the same risks that were discussed uh, by Joe uh, regarding fingolimod. Um, there are concerns about uh, bradycardia and lymphopenia occurs, that will occur in all patients who actually take it. Macular edema is of some concern. Uh, very, there are several drugs that you shouldn't take along with this or fingolimod or saponimod. Uh, but all in all, um, relatively safe drug and uh, very effective. And um, it does not require a first dose observation. Uh, people up titrate this drug over about a week and make it up to the, um, the dose that's recommended of 0.92 or basically one milligram per day. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know if you could say that the lymphopenia though is an adverse effect. It, it really is to be anticipated with any of the S1P modulators. And at least the data from fingolimod indicates that there's no correlation, at least none that could be found, between opportunistic infections or any infection and the presence of the lymphopenia. So you will see profound lymphopenia in these people, sometimes AIDS-like lymphopenia, but it doesn't seem to have uh, an adverse uh, effect on them in terms of 
putting them at increased risk for infection. And it probably has something to do with the fact that the lymphocytes are trapped in the lymph nodes, uh, but there's still some circulation of cells that are effective in suppressing these infections. So, uh, yeah, th yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Joe, because I mean, I certainly agree with you. The lymphopenia is part of the mechanism of action of the drug. And, um, and in fact, you can almost use it to make sure your patient is taking their medications. Right. If, they, um, if they aren't lymphopenic, then you are concerned that they're not taking it. And one nice thing about this drug is that it doesn't kill off your old immunity. It's all still there, just stuck in the lymph nodes, more or less. Okay, good. So emerging agents, emerging very soon. Joe, tell us a little bit about ofatumumab. Yeah, so this is uh, a drug that is an anti-CD20 like uh, ocrelizumab. There have been two studies looking at it, Asclepios, Asclepios 1 and 2. Large numbers of patients, nearly a thousand in each of these studies. And uh, one of the uh, remarkable things is how rapidly the, this drug works. So within about a month's time, they saw this tremendous reduction in gadolinium enhancing lesions. So uh, it was 97% in one study and 93% in the other study. And this was against an active comparator. This was against teriflunamod. Uh, and uh, there was also a very significant reduction in annualized relapse rate, greater than 50% in both the studies when compared to an active comparator, namely teriflunamide. And uh, again, it proved to be safe and extremely well tolerated. So um, this is a, a drug that I think there's some excitement in the community about. This is a, a drug that's uh, administered by injection and the patient could administer it themselves. So there's a convenience uh, for them. They don't have to go to an infusion suite now to get their anti-CD20 and it probably decreases the expense, it certainly decreases the infusion expense associated with receiving ocrelizumab. Okay, so, and, and now we're gonna to get to discussion of the factors that, that one could consider when picking a therapy. And as you can see, there are many, I have to keep in mind, and this is actually an important slide to come up now because there's a number of questions that are already in the queue related to when to start treatment and how you pick therapy and, and such. So Joe, why don't you take us through this? So um, I, I'm giving you my philosophy and my philosophy is that the earlier you treat people, the better off they are. That's been demonstrated uh, f since the benefit trial with interferon beta, uh, interferon beta 1b. And uh, I like to keep the disease well suppressed. Uh, I tell the patient, let me worry about your disease. I, I want to be the one worrying about it. And I don't, I, I don't want them to have any activity if, I, if we could avoid it. So that's what's in the back of my mind as the physician. Of course, the patient is part of this equation and, and they have to realize that there are risks and benefits with anything that one undertakes. So uh, this slide very nicely portrays the type of issues that, that one deals with. And that is, um, Anne mentioned earlier the prognostic features. They go into this calculation as to what drug to select. Obviously, if you have somebody who has rather benign disease, you might want to select a drug that is more of an immunomodulator, one that uh, has a long safety record. Uh, if the patient's considering pregnancy, that's another issue. Um, the issues of monitoring of, are of concern. There are people that you know may not be taking the drug that you give them or uh, may not come back to have their laboratory studies tested. And that can be uh, a huge concern with certain drugs like Lemtrada or, uh, excuse me, Alentizumab, where you need to monitor them uh, periodically. So uh, safety, tolerability, convenience, monitoring, pregnancy issues, cost, uh, fighting with the insurance companies is an issue, and sometimes it simply becomes overwhelming. Uh, the patient preference, they might not want to inject themselves and be adamant about it. Uh, your experience with the drug plays a role in it and the mechanism of action of the drug. So uh, all of this goes into deciding what drug uh, one is going to select. So you've answered this in part, uh, Joe, and, and it's one of the, or two of the questions that are already in the queue, but 
elaborate a little more on early, early intervention. Yeah, so um, we know that the earlier you start there, obviously you have to feel comfortable that the patient has multiple sclerosis. And that's why the criteria we talked about earlier are so important. You, you don't want to be treating a patient that doesn't have multiple sclerosis with these drugs. They're costly and they have risks with them. And studies done at a number of institutions have demonstrated that the misdiagnosis rate with multiple sclerosis still remains at about 10 to 15 percent. But once you feel comfortable with that diagnosis, what's been clearly demonstrated is that the earlier you start treatment, the better patients do, and they don't seem to catch up if you start that treatment later. So uh, finding that most appropriate treatment early is, is a key uh, in, in uh, treating patients with multiple sclerosis. So, so, Anne, one of the questions that comes up about treating CIS. Well, I treat it, if that's the question. Uh, that's I, the if, question. If, if, if I'm convinced that the patient has clinically isolated demyelinating syndrome, uh, then by all means, I would treat that patient because the data from a number of studies, as Joe said, have, have all pointed toward patients doing better with, with fewer relapses and um, you know, it's hard to get a long-term idea because you can't do a placebo-controlled uh, trial for 20 years. But, uh, but most of the um, database-type um, information does indicate that uh, patients do better when they're treated uh, probably within a year of their onset. Plus, there are seven randomized controlled studies of CIS that all show there's a benefit to starting treatment at that point. So let's take a look at the, the timing of high efficacy disease modifying therapies, Joe. Yeah, so um, clearly the early initiation, as you've mentioned, of uh, disease modifying therapy uh, alters uh, the outcome in these patients. There's improved disease control and the long term outcome. I personally, I mean, I've been practicing as have both of you for a long period of time, and there's been a difference in the prognosis of patients with multiple sclerosis now that these drugs are available. The frequency with which we see people go on to progressive disease, at least in my experience, and I haven't looked at it in a scientific fashion, ha has changed. Uh, the prior statistics were that 50% of patients with multiple sclerosis relapsing remitting disease would have progressive disease within 10 to 15 years of the onset. And I'm, I'm not seeing that. So I think we've made a big difference with the disease modifying therapies we have. You reduce relapse rate, you reduce disability, you reduce the brain atrophy that's seen, and simply put, you keep people healthier. Uh, and in some instances, probably on a plateau. Uh, so I'm uh, quite keen on uh, making sure that we suppress disease activity in these patients. Okay, so Anne, let's discuss the choices, the two main choices that uh, clinicians think about when starting therapy. Right, Fred, this is, this is a big uh, question for a lot of, um, for us taking care of patients. I mean, it's either uh, you're gonna start with a highly efficacious, but almost always higher risk agent uh, and try to suppress disease as much as possible and monitor very carefully for safety. Um, or you um, start out with a, a less risky, but also probably less effective drug, uh, such as one of the um, immunomodulators or teriflunamide. Um, and then you monitor treatment response with MRIs and frequent clinical exams and you move up the ladder if you run into problems with um, suboptimal response. So, um, so with both of these, there's pros and cons, obviously. And um, uh, I, of course, take into account uh, what my patients want, me, want, how they feel about risks and um, how they feel about jumping in with a high FC drug. Some people just won't do it. Um, and of course, I look at their prognosis as much as I can, given that we can't really 100% prognosticate, uh, but I look at the factors and I point out to them, I'm very honest with them about what their poor prognostic factors might be and 
why I might recommend that they go on a high efficacy drug at the beginning versus a um, uh, going the escalation approach. Uh, but it's ultimately, I think, a decision at least between the provider and the patient, if not the patient themselves, and they're the one that has to take it. So, um, so it's there's no easy answer to this question. Good. So let's get our audience involved again. So here's your question. Well, immunomodulators dropped and cell trafficking picked up, cell depleting picked up. And I don't know, dropped dramatically. Okay, uh, Anne, Joe, any thoughts about this? Um, well, this is a young woman and we don't know what her concerns are. We're not sure whether she's planning on having a family, but there are certain drugs that I like to go to in individuals that are planning, females that are planning a family. So uh, I don't think there's any wrong answer, to be honest with you, as long as you monitor the patient carefully. Uh, my sense is she has good prognostic features. And uh, if she was anxious uh, about some of the more aggressive therapies, I'd say an immunomodulator is, is perfectly fine. And if she wasn't, uh, I would have no problem with a cell depleting agent or cell trafficking inhibition agent. So one of our attendees has asked, does the presence of optic neuritis make a difference in choosing? Not for me. It's considered to be a good prognostic uh, factor, but it's only one of so many as we you know, looked at in an earlier slide and, and each one ha has a role. So I, you know, it's, it's, and these are just statistical things and, and the patient may act differently than the statistics. And, and, and so another member of the audience asked, does one poor prognostic factor mean that they have a poor prognosis? I don't, I don't think you could say that. No. Right, I and can... as you were saying at the start about the crystal ball in is, is that, that these are for groups and that in fact, prognosticating for individuals is very difficult. That is so correct. Every time I thought I knew the answer, I was wrong. <laughs> well, I think the next case nicely illustrates the contrast in terms of the features that may be poor prognostic features. Good point. So let's move on to the next case. This is Jason, a 46-year-old African-American male. He's a physician and is concerned because of his potential exposure to SARS-CoV-2. He has a tremor and incoordination that was first noticed three weeks earlier. He has paresthesias of both legs for the past three days, that lasted three days, sorry, one year earlier, and he has slight visual blurring in the left eye and urinary frequency and urgency. He was diagnosed with MS in 2018. He was started on interferon beta. Uh, his exam has shown slow cognition, a pale left optic disc uh, with a right afferent pupillary defect, bilateral gaze evoked horizontal nystagmus, a tremor of the right upper extremity with dysmetria on finger to nose and heel knee shin, and diffusely brisk reflexes and an abnormal tandem gait. And here we see his MRI findings, and, and I don't know how well that shows, but he's got a decent amount of lesion load on the top on the T2, including his brain stem, and he's got uh, active disease shown by gadolinium enhancing lesions in the bottom frame. So let's ask the audience now, how would you treat Jason? Remember, he's concerned about his exposure to COVID-19. So Joe, with many patients and clinicians being concerned about the ongoing pandemic, talk a little bit about the, the impact of COVID-19 on treatment paradigms for multiple sclerosis. Sure, I'd be delighted to. <laughs> and this, Fred, has been uh, one of the chief reasons why we get phone calls in the office. There have been days where there have been 20 and 30 phone calls from our MS patients, and I'm sure at Mount Sinai and Wash U, you had the same experience. Patients saying, oh my God, do I have to get off my drug? Uh, and it turns out that uh, this particular disease, COVID-19, due to the SARS virus, um, the, the problem seems to be not so much the viral replication, but the immune 
uh, effect that, that is triggered by it. So there's this hyperimmune response. And what we've found, although there have been a number of recommendations that have come out, little hard evidence to support uh, the recommendations. And what seems to, uh, what we seem to know currently is that um, people have done quite well on disease modifying therapies. In fact, a couple of the disease modifying therapies are now being used in clinical trials for the treatment of COVID because they affect the immune system in a salutary way. Um, so uh, the recommendations are for people to remain on their therapies. There are a couple um, drugs that you might consider not instituting. Um, so alentizumab is one since you get this profound lymphopenia and there's been concern about it. And cladribine is another where there's a lymphopenia that occurs. Uh, but those individuals that have been on uh, these drugs don't seem to have any higher risk of experiencing increased morbidity and mortality with COVID uh, than anybody in the population. In fact, the people that have been hospitalized and have required ventilation with multiple sclerosis uh, have by and large been older people with progressive disease on no disease modifying therapy and have multiple comorbidities. Uh, and that's the very same population uh, minus the MS as the group that we're finding in the population at large, older people with comorbidities. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is, at least in our experience at Penn, we've not seen COVID-19 infections triggering MS relapse. Uh, you know, we, we often think of viral disease triggering a relapse, but uh, we've not seen that yet. Um, so I think a lot of the concerns uh, that people have had are probably unfounded. Okay, so we think that Jason needs to switch his therapy. So, and that pace like Jim, Jason, sort of bad relapsing remitting MS, you need to switch therapies. How do you handle the switch? So um, he does have a number of poor prognostic uh, indicators and he's a physician and he's worried about COVID. I agree with Joe. Um, I've been um, following the uh, covims.org uh, North American registry, and it's finding exactly what Joe just said. I think he did publish some of his cases out of Penn. Um, patients who are dying are the same people who are dying who don't have MS, older men with comorbidities. And um, so, whereas the whole population in that registry is, is primarily women and they have recovered. So uh, that being said, there, I don't think we have any hard evidence at all that any of these uh, immunomodulators or immunosuppressive agents or whatever you want to call them that we use as DMTs in MS have a um, truly um, adverse effect on COVID-19 um, outcomes or on whether people even get COVID-19. Um, so that said, I think with him, the, the real thing on the table in front of me is his MS. It's it's problematic, he's not responding to his present agent. So we need to find the best agent for him that he'll feel comfortable with. So I wanna be honest with him about that and tell him that I think he needs a high efficacy drug. And, um, and then I would just go through all of these, the pros and the cons as I see them. And we look at all of his medications and his comorbidities and whether any of those would throw out some of the the high efficacy medications that we would consider. And then we go from there and we monitor him and he's careful. Uh, he works in, as a physician, so he's around patients. He has to be careful, but he should be smart enough to know how to be careful and hopefully he won't get it. And if he does get COVID-19, he'll probably do okay. Great, thank you. So let's ask the audience our final question. Okay, so immunomodulators went down, cell traffic inhibition went up, cell depleting therapies went up, and I don't know went down. So, <laughs> Joe, Ann, thoughts? Uh, well, I treated uh, this patient, a very similar patient. It was at a time before the anti CD20s were available, and I wanted to shut off the disease as quickly as I could. So he turned out to be JC virus antibody positive. Nonetheless, 
uh, I started him on that Elizamab uh, with the understanding that in a year to a year and a half, I'd switch him to something else. Uh, and uh, that's uh, precisely what we did. So uh, I selected a cell depleting therapy and I would have probably selected either natalizumab or an anti-CD20, probably an anti-CD20 because I know he's JC virus antibody positive, but we didn't have either the rituximab data or the, the, uh, the availability of ocrelizumab at that time. And what do you think? Well, bef before February or March of this year, I think I would have gone with a cell depleting therapy, most likely a B cell depleting agent because they act quickly and uh, very effectively and uh, patients do well with them. Uh, now, you know, even though I just said that there's no data and there is no data to say that those drugs are not, um, don't put people at more risk, uh, there is certainly the thought that one might use something like natalizumab initially uh, because it is also very effective. And even if he is JC virus antibody positive, uh, his risk of getting PML in the first couple of years are, is still fairly low. And then maybe we can get to the point where we have a vaccine uh, that he can take, and then he could potentially at that point go on a, um, a B cell depleter or one of the other agents um, such as oral cladribine. Um, so, um, um, you know, I'm now thinking down the road a little bit about vaccines and when we're gonna have a vaccine and what all these drugs are gonna do to vaccine uh, response and you know we don't really we certainly don't know it for a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, um, but uh, B cell depleters are probably not going to lead to a great response to most vaccinations. So, so I was thinking about that as well. So we have data for many of the ages that they decrease the take of vaccines, but don't eliminate it. Um, so they still get some take. I actually probably would have put him on myself on on ucrelizumab. Um, but one of the things that we're going to be looking at now is how well our patients, and we have lots of them now in New York City, how well they've mounted an immune response when they've had the infection. So you're looking at antibody levels, and that may give us some idea of how well they do when we do have a vaccine. Yeah, that'll be very, very helpful information. So I think today's discussion was very useful. Uh, and uncovered some areas where we may need to make some changes. So let me summarize the three actions uh, that I'd like for our audience to take away. These are sort of smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, timely. So combine diagnostic features with prognosis as best one can to determine the therapeutic approach to relapse and remitting MS. Partner with the patients to discuss treatment goals to optimize outcomes. And Joe went through the various issues here. Uh, so it's very, very important to have the patient on board. And then integrate the most recent clinical data into the treatment paradigm of patients with relapse and remitting MS. And so we still have time to take your questions. I've got a bunch of them in the queue, but we can take more as well. So I'm going to go move over to the questions um, and start triaging them. Um, and, and one I wanted to get to, let me see if I can find it here was, okay, so we talked about early treatment of CIS, uh, but what about RIS? What do you think about treating that? So uh, I have changed the way, the way I look at RIS. I think RIS is really just a form of multiple sclerosis. And uh, I, the, the data suggests that if you follow these people over time, they're going to become clinically symptomatic, at least a significant proportion of them. And therefore, I have uh, started treating patients with RIS. Uh, that was not the case uh, when it was first described, at least for myself. I, uh, uh, and there's data that I'm sure will be generated from the study of RIS that uh, is underway. But uh, I have generally treated patients that have RIS, particularly those that have CSF abnormalities, uh, oligoclonal bands. And I, I was, I was going to say, I mean, this is a situation where you have to be really, really confident that your MRI looks like demyelination, that you're not uh, 
miscalculating and, it, and it's vascular lesions or something that doesn't fit into the demyelination paradigm. So um, I think getting a spinal tap and getting information from there, and if that's indicating an MS-like profile, then, then I would certainly recommend treating. Uh, if it doesn't, I'm not so sure. Yeah, so uh, I would agree with Anne. I mean, the only people that I treat are ones that I feel very confident uh, have MRIs that are MS. Some of them have contrast-enhancing lesions uh, mm -hmm. and uh, generally have had eleva elevated oligoclonal bands in the spinal fluid. So uh, those people I, I, have been, I have been treating. And I think that there are going to be some criteria coming out in the future, such as using T2 star and, and looking for the central vein sign in individuals that is going to help us in distinguishing MRIs that are the consequence of microvascular disease and those that are the consequence of multiple sclerosis. So while I agree with both, the, both of you, there are no data to support those recommendations. Well, I didn't say it was a recommendation. You asked me what I did, not whether I recommended it. Okay, so <laughs> do as I do, don't do as I say, or? Yeah, like, something like that. I mean, like isn't that, that what you told your this, kid? This, this, yeah, this is CME, so I just want to clarify that. And so someone's asking, why not include the optic nerve and criteria? And, and I, I will tell you that in the committee meeting, neuro-ophthalmologists made an impassioned plea to include it as a fifth site. Uh, and, and biologically, there are good reasons. However, the reason why it wasn't included, and Joe alluded to this issue of misdiagnosis, if you had the optic nerve, and let's take our first case, Julia, if she had an enhancing lesion in her optic nerve and one juxtacortical lesion, she would meet criteria for diagnosing multiple sclerosis. And we were worried that that was just too easy. And so that's why optic nerve wasn't included. Uh, let's get to some other questions. So, oh, here's one. Uh, uh, you have a patient, where did it go? It's in here, so, oh, here. A patient on natalizumab for five years, still JC virus negative. Are you comfortable leaving the patient on the drug? So the patient's on natalizumab, is that the question? Yeah, natalizumab, five years, JC negative. Yes, yeah, so I have patients that have been on natalizumab since it was reintroduced to the market and remain JC virus antibody negative. The risk of, of uh, developing PML if you're JC virus antibody negative is probably on the order of one in 10,000. It's probably on the same order of somebody who is placed on fingolimod, where, by the way, the JC virus antibody test has not been validated as, as some mitigation risk strategy. Um, so yeah, I leave them on it. On the other hand, I. Uh, try to get quarterly JC virus antibody tests on the patients on natalizumab. Uh, that is a big concern to me. So anytime they become positive, and I don't use the titer, uh, once they become positive, they're positive in my mind, uh, and I take them off the drug. But I still have patients that are rock steady, uh, negative on the drug for long periods of time. Right, and you anticipated one of the questions here about the titer. So... Uh, that's good. And in fact, I'll, I'll echo that. We've got people who want it since 2006. And if they stay negative, there's really nothing else going on with them. They do very well. I'll triple that. Good. Let's go back to the RIS for a second. Since you discussed treating, uh, what do you treat it with? Well, I, so, go ahead. Not, go ahead. I personally would not go with a, with a very risky medication unless the MRI looks horrible and I'm a bad neurologist and not picking up the clinical signs that I should be picking up. But generally speaking, I, 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 I am concerned about putting a patient at risk for a medication when they don't actually have a disease per se. So, um, so I tend to go with the lower risk agents, but still monitor them very closely for any progression or new clinical or initial clinical signs. Okay, so we got yeah, lots of so, questions, but we still have plenty of time, so keep sending them in. I'm sorry, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I, I do the very same thing, which is uh, since they don't have a well-defined disease, 
I start with something that is safe uh, and monitor them carefully. So uh, I think that's a not unreasonable strategy. Okay. And so if we start with a high efficacy agent, say a self-depleting uh, agent, uh, are there data that we can then de-escalate to see what happens? So far, there has not been a study that I'm aware of. Uh, I do, I have been um, in committee meetings uh, discussing trying to do such a study. Um, maybe you two are aware of such a study, but I'm not. So, uh, so this is a conundrum and we're, we're right now making decisions based on lack of evidence. Right, I'm, I'm unaware of any studies that have looked at it, but then again, there are uh, drugs that we use that um, in a way are time limited. So you put the patient on cladribine and you know, it, it's not something that they're taking indefinitely or you put the patient on alemtizumab and they're not taking it indefinitely. And uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, Meet Baror, is very keen on studying whether you could take patients who have been placed on the anti-CD20s off the drug eventually. So um, there is that possibility that you might not need anything afterwards. But that study hasn't been done yet. And... No, no, I, I realize that. I realize yeah. that. So we do have some questions here to that point is, and when can you stop therapy? Sadly, I don't know that you ever can, uh, unless maybe you're using alentuzumab or oral cladribine and the patient is, or you've done a hematopoietic stem cell transplant and the patient is rock solid uh, stable. But for most of our agents, I'm not sure that we can ever stop. So well, we're, I, we're studying. I think for relapsing remitting disease, I agree with Anne. Uh, I do for the most part. However, there is a study that uh, Dr. Corboy at the University of Colorado has designed and we're part of, you guys may be part of it as well, uh, the PCORI study, which is where individuals who have been free of disease for a long period of time, uh, that is both clinically and radiographically and are older, uh, have their therapy stopped. Now, that study hasn't read out yet, but there's been nobody calling and saying uh, we're concerned because we're seeing increased disease activity now that in half the patients we've stopped the drug. Yeah, that's the DISCO MS study and uh, it'll be interesting to say and it's people 55 years of age and older. Correct. Um, let me we're go in back. that study. Yeah, oh, sorry, Anne, go ahead. I was just going to say we're in that study and one thing I worry about with that study which I've mentioned to John is that people who want to go in it are people who are have been stable for a long period of time, which is one of the requirements anyway, but yeah. you're not seeing people who are older who have pro even progression, but certainly not relapses or, or gaining new MRI activity in that study. So it's a very select group of people that would be taken off drug who have been stable for several years and aren't gaining new lesions off drug. But it's a start. Yeah, it's a start. Okay. Let me go back to the IRS. So uh, how, what's the time frame? So how likely is a patient with radiologic isolated syndrome uh, to develop symptoms? How long does it usually take? If I recall the data, it's usually within a year or so that something will happen if you don't do anything. Yeah, and there was five years, it was, I think, a third. Third. Yeah, yeah that was Darren Akuta's data. I think in five years, one third of individuals had clinical symptoms. But it wasn't the IRS. We're not talking about the IRS. We're talking about RIS. The IRS is the one that's going to call you after you file your taxes. Did I say that backwards? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Okay, all right. So, so while we're on that, someone did ask about uh, immune reconstitution. So that's another IRS. You want to talk about that, Joe? Immune reconstitution, yes, yeah, sure. So this is a concern. This is a, an entity that was first described uh, in HIV patients where you put them on antiretroviral drugs, and one of two things happen. They either, if they had a disease like cryptococcal meningitis or PML, you saw this uh, immune uh, reconstitution inflammatory syndrome where there was this robust uh, inflammation that occurred at the site of the infection, and it could be the HIV alone uh, 
to which you had an, uh, uh, an iris response. Or alternatively, you put the patient on uh, antiretroviral therapy, not knowing that they had an opportunistic infection because it was in a parent and it, be, and it blossomed. Now that same term has been applied to the restoration of the immune system when you've taken people off drugs like uh, the individual who develops PML while on natalizumab, they can develop uh, an iris as a consequence, very similar to this, what's seen in the HIV population when you put them on antiretroviral therapy. Uh, and uh, it's a concern. I think that even this aggressive MS that we will sometimes see with certain agents, such as the S1P modulators and with uh, natalizumab, when the drug is discontinued, in a way is an immune reconstitution. It's an immune reconstitution where the MS has just blossomed. Okay. Um, so uh, another question in terms of, of uh, the extended dosing of Tysabri. I want you to say a little bit more about that, Joe. Yeah, so I was quite skeptical <laughs> that this was going to be of any value, uh, only because of what we know about the pathogenesis of PML. But uh, it appears, at least from data generated by John Foley and others, that when you extend the dosing of Tysabri to six weeks or eight weeks, that the risk of PML declines uh, very substantially. And it still appears to suppress disease activity. Now, one of the problems with natalizumab is that the dosing is not based on weight. So if you look at the uh, frequency with which PML is seen relative to the population, it's much less often in the United States than it is in Germany or Europe in general. And one of the thoughts is, is that we're just too damn fat. And, uh, you know, we're actually giving uh, much less natalizumab relative to, to body mass index or weight than people in, uh, in other countries where the BMIs are, are less. Um, that's a thought. It's, uh, there's some preliminary data to suggest that may be the case. Uh, and it might be, we might be capable of driving the rates down with extended interval dosing, but I think you can eliminate the risk entirely in the JC virus antibody population by stopping the drug and, and starting another. Okay, good. Uh, I have a question here is, uh, when is it indicated to do a bone marrow transplant? Ann, you wanna take that? I will. I don't know that it's ever indicated right now because we don't have true solid controlled data to, to support it, but there's certainly a lot of uh, data using hematopoietic stem cell uh, transplants in um, relapsing patients that suggests that it in some people can really halt the disease for long periods of time. Uh, the problem is we don't now have and probably will never have a great controlled randomized trial for this uh, procedure, which is extremely expensive and um, north of 100,000 at least uh, at our institution. There is a study uh, that's about to get started, maybe it has already started called Beat MS, which is going to look at this in more depth and try to do more of a, more of a controlled look at hematopoietic stem cell transplant. But uh, I, th I think that the expense is offset when you look at what the expense of these drugs are. I mean, these, these drugs that we use are outrageously expensive. So it's not unusual for them to be 60 to $100,000 annually. So if we thought that hematopoietic stem cell transplantation was highly effective and safe, then you would eat that expense. Uh, and in response to your question, Fred, the population that I think uh, merits stem cell transplantation is the MS patient with leukemia. Oh, that's an easy one. That's good. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have some folks who are to a primary care practitioners. And so they're asking, what are the signs and symptoms they need to look at and when to refer? Um, so let me, let me start on that. So anyone with neurologic 
symptoms or signs ought to get referred to a neurologist. The issue with multiple sclerosis is because it can affect any area of the central nervous system, it can produce any neurologic sign or symptom. Uh, the whole gamut, starting with vision and going down to numbness and tingling in the, in the legs. Uh, now, there's still a large differential diagnosis, but if someone's having neurologic symptoms, you know, then they need to be referred in to be looked at. And, and along those lines, and I'll throw this out to you too, there's a question of, uh, and the RIS people, what else could be going on with them? What are the things that you, that you see uh, that make it not MS? Well, I mean, there are a number of things that can cause ditzels on the brain MRI uh, that may or may not look like demyelination. Um, I've even seen a person who had multifocal lymphoma who had enhancing ring enhancing lesions that was initially thought to be MS, um, but that person had symptoms, uh, so it was an RIS. But there are a lot of things that can cause uh, CNS lesions in the white matter in the corpus callosum even, uh, uh, primarily vascular, but also migraine. Um, uh, I could, there are, there are papers that list hundreds of, of differential diagnoses, but there are uh, certainly people nowadays look for neuromyelitis optica, uh, which doesn't usually look exactly like MS. And uh, now we have a blood test that's reasonably uh, sensitive to pick it up. And then um, uh, anti-MOG, anti-myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein against the, the native uh, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein that's on the surface of cells. And that seems to be a, a separate entity, a separate disease from MS, but can look similar. So those would be two things to look for that might. So what, uh, we talked a little bit about mistaken diagnosis earlier, and it turns out that the majority of individuals that are mistakenly diagnosed as having multiple sclerosis have been mistakenly diagnosed because of MR, people rely too heavily on MRI. They looked at the MRI and they said, oh, you know what, this, this must be MS, look at these lesions. And as Ann mentioned, there are many, many things that cause it. But if you take a population that's older, say 50 and above, and has comorbidities such as diabetes or hypercholesterolemia or hypertension, the frequency with which they have an absolutely normal brain is very, very small. I mean, we will always see one little thing or two little things or many little things. And sometimes we scratch our heads, even in young people, they come in, they have multiple white matter lesions, you have no idea what it is, no history of migraine, and you say, I don't know what this is, you were probably born with it. And it doesn't change over time. So uh, from time to time, we, we just don't know. Fair enough. Okay, this is an interesting one. The, the, the writer thought it was a little off topic, but it's actually a very good question. And that is a patient who's on a disease-modifying therapy, in this case, teraflutamide, it's grandparent, and the grandkids are going to get their shots, MMR and HEP and all of those. Uh, is there an issue? For the grandparents to be around, baby, uh, if, baby, they, if they body. already have, if they already have immunity and they're on teraflunamide, I think not. Um, that that's a drug that doesn't uh, remove your on your old immunity. Uh, it doesn't kill off your cells. So I think they would be fine in that case, as far as I know. Uh, certainly, those patients have been given um, vaccinations in the past, and and. Uh, so, Anne, would you recommend that they get their immunity checked for, say, uh, MMR and, and for varicella? Well, perhaps. Um, that might not be. But you're talking about these kids are getting vaccinated, correct? Kids With are getting vaccinated. But, but say, yeah. varicella and MMR are live vaccines. Right. Right, they are. Um, well, m perhaps it would be best to, um, to have the kids stay away from the grandparents. Uh, maybe that wouldn't be so hard right now. Um, and exactly. they've been, I can tell you it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, if these grandparents are the caregivers on a daily basis, it might not be a bad idea to check. I've actually checked this myself in patients who had this very same situation just to make sure. Um, but I would say that sometimes people, and I've been told this from ID folks, people will have had, for example, the, um, 
the childhood um, chickenpox vaccine, which uh, we're too old to have had, but older, but other people have had it, and they won't show that they have antibodies, even though they are supposedly immune. And of course, checking antibodies doesn't check the cell-mediated immunity that you get to these vaccines, so we wouldn't be able to check that very easily. All that said, I guess the safest thing would be to check. Okay, let's get through some some more questions here. Here's one that's uh, someone working in the community said, what are the most uh, efficient tools uh, for measuring progression? So uh, actually, I'm gonna start with that. So it's not, it's not really the MRI, uh, it's a clinical. If you wanna really know about progression, uh, in progressive disease, it's the clinical exam and the symptoms of someone getting worse, usually by walking. Um, we monitor MRI activity as well, but, but clinically is what you want to look at for progression. If you want to look at worsening, which could be either progression or stepwise worsening, uh, then you can include the MRI. Unfortunately, and, and someone asked a related question, we really don't have data to say how much is enough to say it's time to switch. It's, it's one of those things where we know it when we see it, but there's a, a large gray area. So, so I'll just uh, chime in and, and say that I find the history enormously helpful when I'm trying to determine whether somebody is progressing or not. Because sometimes the physical examination is indistinguishable from one six month interval to the next. But when they tell me that they can no longer climb up a flight of stairs or two flights of stairs, or where previously they were able to walk five blocks, but now they're only walking two blocks, that's a pretty good indication that there's something going on. So, and, and that sort of reinforces what Fred just said. Okay, so here's one, lifestyle issues, diet, exercise, in addition to a disease modifying therapy, how do you incorporate those into the treatment plan? And? I always um, recommend that patients uh, get enough exercise and they may have to start low and it may just be walking, but uh, even just for, for bone density purposes, that's a good thing. Um, if, patient, if a patient is really obese, I try to bring that up in a gentle way and, and encourage them to work on that. And in some of my um, more obese people, I've recommended bariatric surgery or at least evaluation for that um, because um, their obesity is much more likely to kill them than their MS usually. Let's get through a few more with rapid answers. So is MS always seen on a brain MRI without contrast? And take that as well. I, I think so. If you if you have a good quality MRI and you've looked at the spinal cord and the brain and it's at least a 1.5 Tesla and you have non-gaps between your axial slices, I think you know it would be very, very uncommon to not see it on an MRI. But but the question was, is it always seen on the brain? And the answer is no. Oh, okay. Okay, that's fine. And how about how about pregnancy issues? Sort of quickly, does it affect your choice if people are planning pregnancy, say, down the road a year or two? Absolutely. It, it has a significant effect on how I'm going to treat them. And uh, I generally default to glutyramer acetate uh, in those that have good prognostic features. Uh, if I want to use a drug that is more highly efficacious, I typically select an anti-CD20 like ocrelizumab, knowing that I can give them the drug, we can wait a few weeks after they've gotten the drug, uh, the drug's gone, so it'll have no effect on the developing fetus, its effect is on the B cells, and uh, once they become pregnant, they're protected by the pregnancy. And I think it's probably important to not use a drug that's associated with rebound when you stop. And that gets into one of the questions where someone had a flare coming off of off, uh, fingolimod. So I think that would be of some importance as well. Um, here's one, uh, any interaction between disease modifying therapies and medical, medical cannabis or uh, CBD? Well, I'm unaware of it. <laughs> not, I'm not aware of it either. Um, uh, I did listen to a lecture recently about cannabis and about THC and CBD and the differences between the two and, uh, and in many, uh, and the many drug interactions they can have. So um, it wouldn't be surprising. But I, I will say from a real world experience, because a significant number of my patients are taking cannabis in some form, uh, 
I have yet to see one that's had some interaction with any of the drugs that they're on. So, uh, you know, it, it, it may be something you could find in an article, but I'm not sure that it really makes a difference. I agree. So, so we've had some, some questions concerning, again, about personal experience with COVID. You heard a little bit, but I think, I think we could sum up and say, I think happily at this point, our general impression is that the patients with MS and on disease-modifying therapies have not shown more adverse events to COVID. And it's really the other risk factors for COVID that appear to be playing the major role in outcome. The issue of whether our therapies are helping by decreasing IL-6 is interesting. Um, we don't have the data yet, but I suspect that we will in time. Um, let's see. Uh, here's one more. Is there any evidence of lack of efficacy from any of the immunomodulators over time? That probably goes more to changes in MS over time than to lack of efficacy, unless one has developed things like neutralizing antibodies to beta interferons or to natalizumab. But, um, but as the disease changes, sometimes um, there's decreased efficacy just due to a change to progression from relapsing. And none of our drugs work that well with progressive disease. Okay, I think I'm going to have us finish up with, with a, a question on a topic we didn't talk about, which is genetics. It says, with a male patient, is there a risk of passing the disease on to his children, and is this a cause for any concerns? So the data suggests that there are over 200 genes that contribute to the development of multiple sclerosis, but each contributes a very, very small amount. And we know that the risk, if you have a family member with MS is increased amongst family members. And the closer the relationship, the, the greater the risk. So maybe 20 times for a first degree relative what it would be if you were unrelated. However, 20 times uh, the population frequency, which is one in 700 to one in 1,000, means that you're talking about maybe a risk of one in 50. So it's not either autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. It's still, it would still be a very small number of individuals uh, in a family that would be affected. So uh, I wouldn't be overly concerned about it. Uh, obviously, if somebody were to develop neurologic symptoms, uh, that, then it would raise concern. But even in identical twins, uh, there's a, not a concordance. Okay, well, we have a lot of questions. I'm sorry that I can't get to all of them, but your engagement has been extremely useful and the feedback has been outstanding. So I'm going to say thank you very much, Dr. Ann Cross and Dr. Joe Berger. Thank you all for joining us and, and don't forget to collect your credit.